But we're just talking about the ETF numbers. I'll try to open them up. Not sure if you have them in front of you. Uh, but if you don't, I've got them from the previous space. And I think this is the 13th consecutive day of net inflows. It's the biggest day of net inflows. I think we're at $631 million in inflows, obviously. Um, uh, 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 BlackRock leading the way. Grayscale's outflows just going down there at $72 million. So the numbers are just very impressive. I think we're at, I don't know how many billion dollars, but we're, we're beating expectations across the board. And I think that's what's being reflected in the markets. And we had a space where we just kind of, uh, we had a panel determining what the price of Bitcoin will be relative to the inflows. And for every, actually, I've got that saved as well. So one of the numbers that was shared, it was all discussed in the, pre, in the crypto town hall space, but I was going to give you a quick recap. One of the numbers that was shared that we talked about uh, to offer insight. So with each $100 million in net inflows, Bitcoin's price has surged to approximately $290. For every billion dollars of net inflows, obviously at a zero, so 2.9K to Bitcoin. And, and then the projections they were doing, I couldn't find anyone with a bear case scenario um, uh, to, to come on stage. And even the, the, those who are usually bearish, it's just tough to be bearish. I'm like, guys, can you please play devil's advocate? They're usually good at doing that. Uh, no one was able Gareth to... Gareth Soloway can give us a bearish possibility? Gareth Soloway is bullish in the midst of the, the bear market, Gareth. Gareth Soloway doesn't know what a, what a... I'm sure he's got a bear case. I'm sure he's got a bear case. If I know Gareth, he's got a bear case too. He's, uh, his mic is connecting, by the way. Just to, I know it shows a speaker, but his mic hasn't connected yet. But the... the um, no one could give a bearish scenario. Like The only one is CPI numbers... Um, uh, kind of a surprise there. Maybe the who they start going Houthis, and then the the option two is like quantum computing. <laughs> they were just desperate for for kind of a, a bearish scenario that they had to go to quantum computing, the good old uh, <laughs> end of the world uh, scenario. But um, well, yeah, I, it's a classic. Can, I can paint a, a slightly bearish scenario, though I'm I'm not a bear at all. By the way, so I mean I've been in in this NASDAQ class since uh, over a decade now. I guess eleven years. So I'm a, I'm definitely a classic Bitcoin hodler, but. If we have nobody to play the other side, I mean, I think the one criticism one could say is, um, you know, I mean, for many years, Bitcoin has been compared to high beta tech stocks, you know, like the Tesla, Teslas of the world, uh, et cetera. And I think that's actually unfair, right? Because uh, we've done many years of analysis and we find that sure, at times it sort of follows, you know, uh, you know, the stocks of Meta, Microsoft, Tesla, and at times it doesn't. And I think like commodities, like other asset classes, crypto is starting to diverge and starting to have non not starting to not correlate but it is true that at times it does correlate right and right now if you for example look at where treasuries are where expectations for interest rates are uh you could say in the recent times if you were to map bitcoin to the performance of well both uh where interest rate expectations are and where for example tesla and these other high beta tech stocks are they are looking a little similar recently uh, now, again, I don't support the fact that those are similar asset classes. I mean, they have behaved similarly at times, but one could say, hey, if we have, for example, an uptick in inflation and the higher expected interest rates, then perhaps, you know, perhaps there's uh, some some uh, uh, some headwinds, so, so to speak, for for this bull run. So that's the only kind of like, I mean, I'd love if anyone else has some legitimate uh, things that uh, would add to that. But that's the one picture I could paint that, you know, certainly uh, could potentially, you know, occur in the next six months or so. Yeah, we've got some voices I haven't had on stage. We've got John, uh, Filippo, and uh, Bill. He'll be great to get their thoughts on this as well. And Ingo. So it's a pretty pretty sick panel you have. And Polka will be coming up shortly. And I can't wait to have them join the discussion as well. But guys, we'd love to get your thoughts. Ryan, good to have you as well. Oh, Bitwise. Ryan, Ryan, Bitwise team has been incredible at joining all the spaces and just in educating everyone on, on the ETF performance. Guys, Ryan, the numbers are just mental. It just keeps getting better and better and beating all expectations and the market's kind of reacting to that. Uh, maybe give us a just general overview of the numbers, the the, the total inflows thus far and uh, relative to projections and what you expect to see. So congrats first, and I would love to like an overview for the audience. Thank you. Thank you. It's been amazing. Seriously, it's been uh, it's been one of the most exciting times of my career. It's been a really exciting month. Uh, you know, we expected these to be really successful, but I think even we've been somewhat blown away in the success that, that not only we've had, but, you know, that the other uh, ETFs have had. And so the inflows are, are really exciting. The price movement in, in Bitcoin is also really exciting. And just the reaction that we're having in conversations with financial advisors and uh, RAs and, and all the people that previously, you know, were waiting to allocate to, to Bitcoin and to crypto as a whole until there was a bit of regulatory clarity, until we had to swap Bitcoin ETFs. Those, those conversations are probably what excites me the most. I think we have... 
uh, you know, a lot of blue sky ahead. And, and so, um, yeah, we, we've had, you know, our, our, uh, we've, sorry, we're, we're obviously going to the numbers here. We're up to uh, close to a billion in AUM for, um, our ETF across the board. We've seen, uh, I think it's, I think it's close to if you exclude grayscale, um, somewhere between like eight to 10 billion in, in AUM across the, the remaining ETFs. And, you know, that's hundreds of millions of inflows into ours and billions of inflows, obviously into BlackRock and Fidelity. And that breaks all records for ETF flows in the first 30 days ever in the history of ETFs. And ETFs have been around since the 1990s. And so, uh, you know, more than a 30 year history broken here in the 30 days. It's really exciting. Ryan, where are you seeing um, most of the inflows from just like category of investors out of curiosity? So you got a billion dollars that, that has come in, right? So you're, that's what, just for the, just for the ETF, the BTC ETF, what, um, I mean, so is it uh, just like family offices? Is it like, what kinds of folks are designed to do this instead of, of course, you know, going directly into the asset class? Yeah, great question. Yeah, it's, it's around a billion with some market appreciation, definitely. So the, the inflows haven't quite been that high, but certainly they've been in the uh, in the high, you know, seven probably seven hundred million range. The there's there's two primary areas that the inflows are coming from. One is RIAs. These are uh, you know registered investment advisors who you can kind of think of these as self employed investment advisors. They don't they aren't affiliated with a Morgan Stanley or. Uh, or Raymond James, or like a big wirehouse. And so they can pretty much make their own decisions as long as they comply with regulations and, uh, and regulations. Uh, they, can, they can really invest in whatever they want as long as it's on, uh, you know, in the client's interest. And so they're the quickest moving group of money managers because they don't have to wait for the big platforms to approve products, to, to go through the training to invest in those products, et cetera. And so REAs are one of the biggest sources of inflows and then financial advisors uh, that are affiliated with some of these platforms that have approved spot Bitcoin ETFs uh, for, for investing are the other ones. So uh, that, that's the two primary buckets, right? And, and a lot of them are still waiting to have those conversations with their clients to educate their clients on what they're doing. But some of them are just getting right into it. They've been spending time educating their clients over the past one, two years, and they've been spending time getting educated themselves on what Bitcoin can do in a portfolio. Someone earlier was talking about you know, the, the lack of correlation that Bitcoin can have with traditional assets. And that's a really meaningful selling point when you're talking to advisors around how they're constructing their portfolios and how they're thinking about adding crypto into their portfolio. Yeah. And are you seeing, uh, yeah, I was the one who's mentioned that. Do you seeing pushback on people like accepting that? Because I mean, really, if you want to like optimize sharp ratios, I mean, it depends on where your risk horizon is. You probably want between, I don't know, one to 5% of your, of your portfolio in crypto generally, maybe not even Bitcoin entirely, but yeah, what's, um, like, are people buying that as an argument or, you know, I mean, you got the old school 60, 40 bonds, which at this, at this point, I think has finally been, you know, uh, debunked uh, enough that it's no, no longer accepted consensus. But I guess what's consensus uh, at this point among folks? Yeah, it's, it's a good point. I mean, one to five percent is definitely that sweet spot. All of the back testing that we run and we, we tend to do it with the 60, 40 portfolio because that's, you know, even though um, it's not necessarily how, how I personally invest or a lot of people I think invest these days, it is how a lot of financial advisors and money managers kind of were taught to think about investing and or how mentors that they looked up to over the past 20, 30 years, 40 years thought about investing. So we run adding 1%, 2%, 5%, uh, even up to 10% of Bitcoin to a traditional portfolio. After 5%, you really start to see like an outsized impact on volatility relative to returns. And, and you do have a high sharp ratio, but that volatility really starts to impact the way advisors are, are thinking about their portfolio and what they're comfortable with. And and 5% is really the sweet spot. You can get a significant boost to your sharp ratio, uh, to your risk adjusted returns without that big of an impact of volatility around 5%. As long as you continue to rebalance, like Bitcoin grows so quickly during bull markets that if you're not rebalancing on a quarterly basis, like financial advisors. Suddenly it becomes the largest do. part of your portfolio, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, which, exactly, uh, exactly. Which is why you have So rebalancing is really important, but, but mm -hmm. yeah, 5% is, is definitely a sweet spot. And we're not seeing a ton of pushback there, to be totally honest. I think a lot of the... So what's holding them back then? Why isn't there why, why isn't there more? Is it just the... Uh, I mean, yeah, what, what, is, what is holding back institutions? Is it the whole, like, just uh, legacy feelings of people like, um, you know, I mean, you know, the Berkshire Hathaways of the world. Warren Buffett calling Bitcoin rat poison squared, um, you know, and other people like that. I mean, is it is it like just basically just feelings and, you know, like legacy emotions or, you know, is there something else going on as to why it's not even growing even quicker? 
I think that's that's part of it. Certainly, people you know look up to Warren Buffett, but they also look to to Larry Fink, right, who's on the other side of the spectrum, being the Bitcoin drum these days. So I think that's playing a little bit less of a role than it used to, but it certainly plays some role. I mean, a lot of it's just education. A lot of financial advisors, like they they spend most of their time trying to build their book of business. They're trying to go get new clients. They're trying to get more money from existing clients. So the amount of time they have had historically to think about Bitcoin or to think about crypto is very, very small. If it's 1% of their portfolio, they're spending less than 1% of their time actually thinking about and studying and looking into Bitcoin. And so some of it's just purely educational. And now that we have Bitcoin ETFs, they're willing to go down that educational journey and spend more time on that than they were in the past. The other is access. So Bitcoin ETFs certainly open up the door to a lot of investors who weren't comfortable allocating or weren't able to allocate directly to crypto assets in the past. But even still, if you're associated with a, a large wire house like a Morgan Stanley or a Charles Schwab, for example, right, you still aren't able necessarily to, uh, and I don't mean to pick on those two in, in particular, it's just ones that come to mind, but a lot of these large financial institutions, the, the wealth managers that uh, have relationships with them and that kind of clear their trades, their platforms and stuff, are still having to wait until those platforms approve these spot Bitcoin ETFs or any crypto investments in general on their platforms. And that process takes a lot longer than most people would imagine. That can take up to a year because there's all of this due diligence that has to happen. There's all this internal education and risk and due diligence uh, meetings that occur. Then there's like a due diligence committee that reviews products. Once they approve them, they have to build educational materials for the financial advisors. The financial advisors have to go through those educational materials and then they have to educate their clients. And then once they're done with all of that, they can finally allocate to Bitcoin, to crypto in, in this ETF format. So that can take a year. So it's really exciting, the inflows we've had. I mean, billions of inflows is crazy into any ETF and that's really, really promising. But I still think that we're a long way from the goal line here uh, as far as how big these things are going to grow. And I think over yeah. the next year, we're going to see continued interest. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think there's uh, quite a way to go. Um, thanks for that. That was a that was a great layup uh, for, or tee up rather, for our conversation to come. Uh, so yeah, want to hear from Gareth. Uh, give us some updates, maybe following on what Ryan said or some updates on the market. Uh, it's obviously been an exciting time. And I'd like to bring in, uh, after Gareth, uh, some of the uh, some, the new speakers here, John and, and Philip. Uh, Philip Webb um, and Alex, of course. Yeah, welcome back, Alex. So, Gareth, go for it. Hey, thank you, guys. Thanks for uh, having the space. Um, so, so yeah, I know you guys were talking a little bit before about you know the potential bear cases for Bitcoin, and certainly the long term case is not bearish, right? But you could argue that short term we've had this big surge up again, uh, just like we had into the spot ETF approval. It looks at least on the short term to be a little bit long in the tooth. I have a big resistance level coming up at around fifty two thousand five hundred. Uh, a couple of the negatives, and again, let's be clear, my long term remains bullish on Bitcoin. I continue to be a swing trader, though, and I'll be short and long uh, on Bitcoin accordingly based on the charts. But one of the things that you could make a case for that is negative is that the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ continues to make new all-time highs, but Bitcoin is not making a new all-time high. Certainly, it has run amazingly off of the lows. It's outperformed uh, in the last year the stock market substantially. But still, you know, if the if risk assets are at all-time highs, where where is Bitcoin? Why isn't Bitcoin hitting those levels? Um, I do think that, again, the spot ETF approval does open the door, and over time, that remains very, very bullish. But but. At some point, what happens when? I mean, let's just let's just play a hypothetical here. Let's just say that you know the CPI stays strong; it starts to inch up, which puts the handcuffs on the Fed from really dropping interest rates, and the economy starts to slip into a recession. And the stock market, because of that, and because of a slower economy, starts to fall. Let's say twenty percent from where it currently is. Is Bitcoin able to withstand that sell-off um, within the equity markets? And you know, considering the the risk asset nature of it i'm not sure at this point i think it's going to grow into that gold where it actually probably does better in these bear market um periods but that would just be my concern the, the stock market is ridiculously lofty i mean we've seen nvidia go up hundreds of percentage points in a very short amount of time what happens when we see a correction or a bigger move down in the stock market i would say that's probably for me the only bearish scenario on Bitcoin, which is just that risk asset deleveraging type thing, if that occurs in, in risk assets. 
Yeah, yeah, I was kind of outlining some of that a little earlier, right before you joined, um, and and appreciate the additional color. I mean, is there anything else? Are we missing something here, right? I mean, of course, always those black swan events or events that you know can really move the needle are sometimes things we can't predict by by nature. But I mean, what other big, you know, like for for I a mean, long I'm time not, we knew the I'm ETF not... was coming, so we knew that was a tailwind, right? But I, I'm I'm struggling to see with the same thing here, right, in terms of uh, headwinds, so to speak, like predictable headwinds. Yeah, if I could jump in. Sure. Sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. I just, you know, recent news today, uh, a bearish, you know, news catalyst, um, you know, Genesis uh, cleared to uh, sell their 1.3 billion GBTC. Now I'm not saying, uh, I'm, I'm wondering what you guys would have to say on that, especially Bitwise. Um, but like, certainly, you know, I speak to uh, the retail participants, millions of retail participants. And, you know, that's something that, you know, they're talking about on the forums today. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, Gareth, a bit wise, Ryan. Yeah, you want to? What do you have for that? Yeah, no, I think I think look, there's still some significant sell side unlocks that that have happened. We've we've seen or that are going to happen. We've seen that happen over the first month, and while it certainly created some lag on the impact that these ETFs can have, uh, clearly we've we've broken out of that so far. But you know, these are the overhangs uh, from 2022 that are still in 2024 coming back to bite us and. Uh, I think this Genesis one is is pretty material, and on the one hand, it's it's good to see that uh, some of these some of these bankruptcy proceedings and uh, problems of 2022 are working themselves out in a way where customers don't lose 100 percent of their funds or a high percentage of their funds. But yeah, I mean that's a lot of sell pressure. We've we've seen more than that sell pressure come from Grayscale's GBTC already, so I think the market can kind of take it on the chin, but. Uh, you know, we might see a little bit of, of wobble uh, between now and when that's done. That's three days worth of sell pressure-ish, to be clear. So, I mean... Yeah. And, and just jumping in here in, in regards to the GBTC news as well with the, the sell from Genesis, I also think that it should be just... It shouldn't be discounted and kind of made it as, an, as a no-brainer that you know, institutional money or let's say pension money or 401k money is going to always be coming into Bitcoin's ETFs. That's always going to put, I feel like the, the narrative now is being spun that there's this, this backstop that no matter what happens, there's always money that's going to come in. And, and I do want to remind people that if we do get the bigger sell off in the stock market, those people that might have been allocating to Bitcoin, they will pull back just like anyone. You know, if someone loses their job, they start, they, 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 they spend less money uh, on consumer goods and stuff like that. The same thing will happen if people start to get scared. So, so just don't discount that kind of fear factor that can play into um, Bitcoin's demand, especially even on the spot ETF side. I think those are all good points. Um, let's turn our attention to perhaps the other, um, let's say, ten to fifteen large market cap coins. Um, you know, there's obviously we, we see the list, and one of them is our is our partner for today, Polkadot, who I'm pleased to have for many years have been following uh, them. Uh, we'll have an AMA later, but. If you look at the, let's call it the ten, the, the next fifteen uh, largest market cap, um, you know, assets. Ethereum obviously is number two. It's done very well, but you know, Bitcoin's done you know very well at about twenty percent, nineteen percent or so over the last seven days in terms of the price appreciation. Ethereum is more at like thirteen or so percent. Uh, but then we've got like interesting things across it. I mean, Solana has been on a tear. It's almost twenty percent up uh, over the last week. Um, you know, Avalanche, Avax has done great. Um, you know, other names like Tron have have been up. I mean, every, everything is generally up, but not as up as much. Even Tron, even, uh, even Tron. Tron, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, uh, what what are we feeling about? So, with Ethereum, it makes. I mean, obviously, it's number two. So, there's that, but also there's the you know just rumors of an ETF in Ethereum, and there was Ethereum was going on a tear after those rumors uh, because you know people were like it's next in line. So. You know, we have like what I call the alt, you know, the altcoins, uh, which are way, way, way beyond this thing. But what about the next sort of the largest market cap ones that are not Bitcoin? How are we feeling about where they're where they're headed? Right. Because they don't have the current tailwinds of a ETF right directly. So it's a little bit different. But at the same time, they seem to be all correlated to some degree. Right. To someone's point, it's even Tron. So what are people's thoughts about the rest of the um, other crypto assets? I think that there's a great case to be like, a, you know, separate from Bitcoin, a great case to be made for Ethereum, just that that's going to break past all time eyes. I know we're not talking about Ethereum, but for the greater cryptocurrency market, as we're getting down, you know, through the top 10, top 25 coins, just, you know, general kind of big picture thesis is that these coins, you know, 
uh, Solana's chain links, anything with the even polygons, you know, something going on. Uh, those are going to you know go up with the market because you know the wealth effect does happen. People feel rich when Bitcoin gets to 80k or Ethereum gets to 7k, and they think, well, I can only get a 2x or, or 3x, and uh, and uh, then they just rotate into into smaller coins. So, uh, uh, I mean, not to mention the fact that coins like Chainlink and Solana and you know so many others have like legitimate uh, you know just uh, things they're doing that you know is so different from one cycle ago, two cycles ago, where the only reason these coins would go up is because, uh, you know, a rising tide uh, uh, raises all ships. But uh, I'm certainly bullish. I don't know if we want to talk about specific ones or what other people think. Well, yeah, I want to hear. So there's two ways to think about it. Number one is what you talked about and what we talked about before, which is just, hey, let's diversify, you know, just like you wouldn't hold probably all gold or, you know, all all silver, um, you know, or wheat or whatever in your commodities portfolio. You'd want to diversify. There's a diversification aspect. But there's another thing, so that's one, and that's we could talk about that, of course. But the second one is that more about at its base and core, what are the things that are driving these next L ones, or in Polkadot's case, L zero, as they call it? Um, what are the things that are driving that? Right. So obviously, I think engagement. I'll just precede the answer with engagement as being one, um, and also usefulness to, for example, developers. I mean, there's probably a reason why Solana has been on a tear even more than slightly more than Bitcoin in the last week. Uh, you know, AVAX has a very useful ecosystem, for example, uh, bridging between Bitcoin and uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, I mean, it's a bit bit of a uh, it's a bit of a process, but I mean, bridges still need a lot of work, but it's still more useful than, for example, I don't know, REN BTC. I mean, not to throw a shade on them, but, you know, certainly cheaper and faster and better on the AVAX network. So I, I, I'm throwing the question out at a fundamental level, right? If you're to be a fundamental investor and take a look at this, why are, why, you know, why is Tron only a, well, Okay, this might be a meme way to phrase this question. Why is Tron only up two and a half percent, and you know Avax and Solana are up like you know eighteen twenty percent? Like, what how, what are people who are looking at these and know these asset classes? How are they differentiating between these? Uh, I mean, I think. Uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, you, you can go. I mean, I was just going to say that. You know, you go, you go. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, I think people are looking for. There's a couple of things. I think one, you know, a lot of a lot of traders are looking for the the next hottest uh, layer one solution, and and Tron's been around for a very long time, and so naturally, maybe they look elsewhere. They look to layer twos, uh, like Arbitrum, Optimism, Polygon, things like that. But but definitely, everyone's trying to catch the next Solana trade. I'm sure. I think one thing people really look at though is is the activity that's happening on top of these blockchains. Like Tron's got a lot of stablecoin. Uh, activity it's i think it's the largest blockchain for usdt or the second largest for usdt so you know stable coin acti activity and stable coin aum is generally a good indicator of uh, real things happening on the blockchain but i think people are looking down down the list of uh you know assets on coin gecko or, or coin market cap and they're looking for the slightly lower market cap assets that have less trading volume they're trying to find the next runner uh that that holds a Solana and Tron just really doesn't meet that criteria in the same way that perhaps a, uh, you know, an avalanche or a polka dot or a chain link or, or something like that does. And so I think, you know, you start to look at what's happening across these ecosystems. What can you do? Is there a burgeoning DeFi ecosystem? Are there NFTs? Are there rising developer counts and, and rising active users? And that's when I think Tron starts to really lag the others because it's, I don't know, kind of, it's been hanging around for a long time. And, you know, I mm -hmm. personally don't spend time thinking about or looking at Tron. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, before the Ethereum uh, 2.0 upgrade, it was actually cheaper by far to trade uh, USDT and US, you know, on Tron than it was on, for example, Ethereum. But, uh, you know, things have changed with uh, the upgrade. But so I think those are good points. Um, yeah, Alex, what, what... And I would just... Alex, oh, yeah, Alex, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, just to speak to Tron specifically, I think with some of these, uh, you know, blockchains, you have to zoom out a little bit. Like, Tron is, I think, up, uh, more than a lot of these other projects that are pumping in the past week. Like, let's check CoinGecko. Yeah, it's, a, it's up over 92% over the past year. So on a one-year time horizon... This past year, but, but, st but still at the price where I originally bought it back in January 2018. Yeah, totally. So from like a trader perspective, like that can factor into the mindset. But I think with a lot of these projects, if you go to like a seven-day range, there's just the trading depth isn't enough to paint the whole picture because you could just have one insider uh that dumps a big stack and that fundamentally uh impacts it but i definitely agree with what all coin daily was saying in terms of rotation i think you know obviously bitcoin tends to lead the pack and then people rotate into 
um, perhaps more risky, but more asymmetric bets uh, as they come through. So I think we're seeing that play out. Um, just to speak to two other categories, too, that I think are really important. I mean, we, we tend to look at the majors, but then there's, like, I think two other, like, leading categories. So uh, the DeFi TVL continues to rise. Um, if you go to, like, DeFi Llama, uh, you can see that's been on a steady upward trend after getting pretty much obliterated in, like, 2022 with all these uh, on Tron? large... Uh, go ahead. Is it is it on Tron we're talking about with the TVL? No, no, I'm talking about uh, overall DeFi TVL across all blockchains. So... Um, I think people tend to like look at the majors, like the tokens uh, themselves, but I think uh, DeFi TBL as well is a good use of that activity point. I forgot who mentioned it, um, but that actually speaks to you know what's driving the demand for a lot of these layer one tokens from a utility standpoint is more often than not use cases like DeFi. So we're actually seeing the TBL locked into DeFi, DeFi rising a lot right now. Uh, I think it hit like a low of like you know forty billion. Uh, in TVL, and we're all the way back up to like 72 billion, and it's actually going like uh, uh, much more vertical right now in terms of TVL. Um, and then I think the other thing uh, to keep in mind is that there's now like I think on the institutional front, now that that is a uh, area that we're seeing a lot more like total dollars come in. Um, I think a lot of these institutions are going to start looking like beyond uh, just you know like ETFs themselves. So, like, the private credit market, for instance, is in the U.S. a $1.4 trillion asset class. Um, and I expect to see a lot more of that coming on chain. Uh, we're working with a few companies directly right now to make that happen. But I think, you know, this is just the other way that we kind of have to develop our thinking from previous cycles is we have not only, like, the retail and, like, niche fund demand, uh, but also large institutions that will start with ETFs, like Bitcoin, but... Uh, I expect them to actually get into, you know, ETH ETF when that's ultimately improved, as well as other on-chain asset classes that uh, they prefer. Mm. Right, great, great overview. All coin. And then we'll tee up the other folks, yeah. Ian and, and some other folks who haven't jumped in yet. But yeah, All coin, what do you think? I just wanted to, you know, we're talking about Tron and I, why maybe that's doing well all of a sudden and just kind of talking about things to look for in all projects, uh, particularly this cycle as opposed to prior cycles in Bitcoin. Because we, we talked about how Tron does about 50% of the largest uh, stablecoin tether. Certainly a big deal. Tether's a lot bigger in the Asian markets. But another thing that was changed, I believe this was changed um, in the last couple of years, is they started uh, token burning mechanisms. And actually that's something Polkadot is uh, doing in a couple months with Polkadot 2.0. And Ethereum did that first, you know, becoming deflationary. And um, that's, uh, you know, certainly something to consider, which uh, I find uh, is always, uh, if there's demand, that's always really good. Do you think, I mean, there's demand, but do we think a deflationary protocol is actually a good thing for the long run, right? I mean, imagine we're on the gold standard, so before Bretton Woods, and uh, instead of, you know, I mean, gold increases in supply by a few percent per year. But imagine that it was um, the other way around, right? I mean, what, uh, what what would that do to our economy, right? And, and like, let's say, I oh, have, have to rewind the clock. Um, you know, I, I and I specifically say that even in crypto, it's relevant because uh, I remember I was chatting with the um, you know the Crypto Kitties team, uh, you know, back back actually in there during the the height of the boom, or really kind of right after, and they were kind of lamenting the fact they had uh, structured their protocol, their ERC seven twenty one protocol, uh, in that way. Uh, and that had led to unintended consequences. So yeah, do we think a deflationary protocol is actually, I'm sure it increases demand for the token and increases the, potentially increases the price, but is that is that really the right uh, structure? Well, they're not all created equal, important to note. Ethereum has been doing it for a while, and so far it's been working, but not everything's set up like Ethereum. Some things could be better, some things could be worse. I think if we're talking about like a, a money or like a gold, like, you know, what's the long-term effects of that? We don't know. We don't know. But I mean, certainly for, you know, different dApps, um, perhaps, uh, you know, just uh, you think about them different. I, I would say that I say deflationary is a good thing. I'm speaking about just this cycle. Once interest comes into the space, once Bitcoin and Ethereum rises, once the, you know, the Fed, uh, you know, increases liquidity, um, I think stuff like that will be good for this cycle specifically. Mm, super interesting. Yeah. Um, perhaps I'll get Udi or other, other yeah, who's jumping in. What's that, Udi? Okay, yeah. uh, it's me, Udi. Uh, that's VM. Uh, actually, it's a pleasure 
Uh, you know, I've been listening to the conversation and I'm actually actually very excited that um, for the first time in a very long while, we're all talking about polka dots because it's one of those coins in the late 2020 and 2021, many of us were actually looking at and uh, seeing its potential. Many persons were even actually saying that polka dot is um, Ethereum uh, version 2, but um, with the new development on Polkadot, I'm actually very, very excited. I've actually made a post on that on um, this piece talking about Polkadot, talking about the supply, talking about actually having the deflationary mechanism into Polkadot, increasing the liquidity. All these is going to really attract investors into Polkadot. I'm actually very excited that the the uh, Polkadot 2.0 is actually putting all of this in place and in the next couple of months and i'm going to see all of this actually happening in polka dots so um kudos to the team kudos for the team actually listening to some of us who have been putting out these ideas to polka dot team and for the first time polka dot team is actually listening to the community and this is actually um i'm actually very excited about this so well done guys i'm actually happy about the development awesome awesome yeah and we're going to be doing an ama with polka dot shortly actually in about 10 minutes or so uh so tee up your questions but uh, great great to have them shout out shout out work excited to be partnering with polka dot uh, really one of the og blockchains and um yeah i'm excited to dive in to their uh new story uh so john I i'd like to uh, ask you, John Linden, uh, here as somebody who is focused on Web three games. What is your thought about you know the question kind of asked earlier, which is in terms of the broad scale layer two, sorry not layer two, layer ones uh, that are out there. So the, the top market cap layer ones uh, that exist. Um, what's driving the different? Uh, let's call it the different performances between them, right? And I, I think it comes. I mean, as a developer myself, I think some of it comes down to engagement. Uh, and uh, ease of development and usefulness of development, for example, and I'd love to get your perspective on that. Yeah, well, so first of all, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I, I think we've seen that, you know, it's been fun. It's been kind of fun watching the industry over the last few years here on, on gaming and gaming chains and who's going to be dominant. And, you know, one, one thing that I, I've noticed is that it shifted. The narrative shifts very quickly. And frankly, it kind of shifts without really any substance. You know, I remember EOS back in the day, it's going to be the gaming chain. And then Wax is going to be the gaming chain. And then it's Ethereum mainnets. And then Polygon has had, had held the reins for a couple of years. And now it's Solana is going to be the king of chains. And what's really Tron, interesting is Tron, Tron was originally a gaming chain. Oh, Tron, chain. yes. I forgot about Tron. Yeah, Tron, you're right. Tron was going to be a big one, too. And we, you know, we play with most of them. And, and I think what, what, what I think we're going to start getting into is let, let's back it up with data, you know. And I, I think we're getting to a point now, um, you know, we, we have a game right now called NFL Rivals. You know, we have about 4 million players out there right now um, that, are, that are playing. I think we're probably one of the biggest Web3 games ever at this point. And what's really great about it is we've been able to kind of onboard this Web2 generation into Web3. I think we now have about 20% 20, 20 of players now have actually created real wallets. You know, we do give kind of this guest half you know half wallet to every player so they can start getting involved in the ecosystem but we're now starting to see you know i think we just crossed yesterday seven hundred thousand active wallets on our chain right and, and i think what we're going to start seeing is is we need to start getting this industry into more of a, a data-driven approach on on who's going to be the king of chains rather than just kind of the marketing fluff and and i, I think that's the, we're heading there quickly and that's one of the things i am excited about and i'm happy to share later on on polka dot what uh, you know we made a decision ourselves purely based on technology, right? It wasn't about massive grants. It wasn't about, you know, um, you know, somebody buying us off, you know, to get the activity. We really chose, made a decision on, on, on what's happening fundamentally with the tech to support that, right? And, and what are some and of the high-level things you, know, you learned from that out of curiosity? And, and just describe yeah, to the I audience know. who may not be as familiar with, like, you know, Blanco's Block Party, which I, by the way, played when it came out yeah. and some other things. Um, like, yep. yeah, how did you make that decision yeah. chain by, perhaps even chain by chain? Yeah, just uh, what, what did you yeah, like, so what did you not like? So a couple things, you know, one, one I will put out there. So I used to be in the studio, uh, studio on Call of Duty, right? So big game, you know, it was a, a tiny little game, I guess, out there, you know, worldwide. And what was interesting about that game is I think at one point, this was several years ago, right? I've been out of, out of that business for a little while. But when I was running one of the Call of Duty studios, I think we were seeing about 1.4 million matches a minute, right? And I still kind of joke a little bit that, like, you know, if, if we just recorded the existence of those matches on chain, we'd probably take down about any chain in the world still to this day, right? Um, so, so we got a ways to go, right? So I think for us, you know, we're looking at obviously kind of the medium horizon and not necessarily the long-term horizon still. But I, th I think what the, the biggest thing for us is that uh, you know, we've actually had a challenge. You know, we have a myth token out there through the Mythos Foundation we started. 
And it's been really interesting. We, there's been a little bit of a disconnect between Web 2 and Web 3, right? To where we have we have a token trading, but the, the reality is that token is only held by a few thousand people on mainnet, right? So that's what the kind of the, the hardcore crypto audience or the exchange audience looks at. It's like, wow, there's only a couple thousand people holding this token. In reality, there's 700,000 people holding the token through the bridge, the bridge mechanism, right? And most of that activity happens on the bridge kind of POA chain. Now, I'll be super honest with you, that's a fairly centralized chain, you know, where we have control of the nodes, you know, it's, it's not a true decentralized L1. And that's one of the things we did look at is we wanted to have this experience to where we could actually now truly decentralize it, right? And that's been a goal of Mythos is start, understand, build, and then let's decentralize. And I think Polkadot, you know, really helps us do that. You know, I love the idea that we become kind of a fully decentralized L1 chain through Mythos that's backed by kind of this, this security and, and um, you know, kind of security and ecosystem of, of Polkadot. But I think what I also love is there's so much there. And frankly, I think this is a weakness of Polkadot is that they haven't really shared their, I mean, I'll, if I had to give a big complaint to Polkadot, they're not a huge um, marketing company. You know, they have not done great on marketing what they can do. And in fact, we're, we're fortunate that we actually get the ability to spend a lot of time, you know, and got to spend time with Gav and got to spend time with Bjorn and all these groups. And we're still learning. We're learning in these meetings of what what that chain is capable of. <clears throat> and I hope that, that that over the next, you know, six to 12 months, that Polkadot community can get out to exactly what all can you actually can do with this chain because it's kind of remarkable you know the polka dot 2.0 stuff is amazing but doing on-chain governance doing voting right from all these wallets right doing staking however you want to do staking right all that stuff while still being secured as a full l1 is pretty exciting so that's one thing that we made a big change to do and what we're going to be doing now is, is on our proof of authority chain we weren't able to truly trade that token because it's kind of this wrapped somewhat centralized token that's a representation of the of the decentralized token with the new polka dot ecosystem we can actually directly trade that chain, trade that token and i think that's going to get really really exciting to where now all of the activity we're seeing in web 2 users is going to be super completely transparent and 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 available to all the web3 audiences so there's a lot i can go into i'll let other people talk here but but we're excited about the transition and like i said we're 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 still getting started i mean four yeah. million players it sounds great. Um, you know, if you want to put out some numbers there, Madden, which is kind of our competitor, we did four million about six months, which is great. Um, Madden's still sitting about about twenty five million players, right? If you want to take it a step further, FIFA Mobile has five hundred million players, including forty four million daily active users, right? So I still say we're getting started as the industry, but I think we've really started to figure out how do we blend these Web two users to onboard them very, very naturally into Web3. And we're seeing, you know, we're we're closing about 150,000 new wallets a month right now just on one game. So we'll, we'll exceed a million wallets, active wallets, within the next two months. And that's, again, that's just one video game. So I've been very, very bullish on gaming in the ecosystem. And I think we're going to see, this year is going to be a pretty remarkable year to see. Man, I wish you were in our gaming, uh, uh, just focused Web3 conversation yesterday. We do have those pretty regularly. So I, I we could unpack that in a whole... Uh, session, if not many. But uh, one thing I want to hone on what you said is about Polkadot, and we are going to be going to Polkadot MA very soon. So Alex, I'll tee up for uh, one of the final combos here, but I'm excited to be chatting with them. You know, I think since it was the Gav put out the first Polkadot white paper in, was it like Gavin Wood put it out in 2016, I want to say? And I'd say from the very beginning, I think a lot of the crypto nerds, so to speak, I, I don't know if that's a term, were, were big fans, right? And, and maybe to your point, John, less so among just sort of the bigger degen market, which I think is a good thing. I think that's like a big thumbs up for Polkadot. Um, you know, by having Polkadot on here on this stage, you know, with all our listeners, I think hopefully some of that will change to your point, right, With in terms of that marketing. But I think from, you know, a lot of the crypto OGs, I think Polkadot's always had a big fan base because of their thoughtful approach, you know, they're effectively their heterogeneous multi-chain, uh, you know, architecture. I think it's just a, a really cool thing to consider. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, I just thought I just, I just thought I'd throw that out. But uh, we will be going to Polkadot soon. Uh, it's good to have Polkadot, the main account, on stage here. Uh, Alex, what do you think? Um, yeah, what makes you know what? Maybe some of the, reacting to some of John's comments. What makes uh, each chain of the large market cap chains different from each other uh, as a developer, as a user uh, of the network? Yeah, I, w I wanted to follow up to what John said because uh, the past six months, I've like found myself. Uh, back on the side of, you know, project that's building on layer ones, like before I was working directly on layer ones. And it's really like shifted my mindset in terms of, you know, how we approach these protocols um, or blockchains. And I think a lot of them forget that at, at the end of the day, like they are a service provider 
to the projects and it, and it is ultimately um, you know these founders that come in and build the the use cases that provide day-to-day -day utility for the network that are really important and I think from our side, like we're, we're building a, a real world asset project at Chateau. So, you know, we're not even doing as much complicated stuff on chain and, and things do look or are relatively commoditized at a, at a tech level for us. Um, but that being said, like, I think there's a massive difference uh, in terms of how, you know, some of the protocols conduct themselves in terms of actually making them an attractive place to go. So. You know, just an anecdotal story, we had uh, a meeting with um, like a top 30 blockchain. I won't say the name, but the founder basically wanted to bring us on. And we had a combo with the BD lead and it was just totally flat. Uh, there were like no resources provided at all. Um, and then we had a conversation with Arbitrum who were uh, going to launch on initially. And that team was just completely on top of it. They immediately gave us every resource we needed from a go-to-market perspective. Uh, they pointed us to a DAO proposal that Arbitrum has up to actually put a portion of their treasury into RWAs. Um, they're setting up Twitter spaces with us, go to market, uh, gave us you know their take on should we do Ar Arbitrum 1 versus Arbitrum Nitro. And so I just wanted to kind of um, second John's point of like, I do think it is important for these ecosystems to be doing marketing and really going out there and making sure that, um, you know, these founders are aware of all the options because being on the other side of the equation now, like there actually are so many players and everyone has their perspective on why they're the best place to be uh, and why their tech is superior to the rest. And from my side, one of the biggest indicators I can have is just how locked in is the team and how good of a job are they actually doing, you know, getting um, the right people uh, in front of these teams and actually setting the teams up for success. So I think if projects like Polkadot and others, you know, want to continue to win, like that's, I think business development and go-to-market partnerships is like one of the strongest places right now because, again, like every blockchain has uh, a theory for why they have the best tech. Um, but for a lot of founders, we look at it as somewhat commoditized, uh, if I'm being completely transparent about it. And so, but Alex, sure Alex is that fair? As, on the development side, though, I'm not sure. So I totally agree. I actually agree with you. I think the business development side is, is overlooked in many ways and is super important, right? But like, okay, developing, for example, like, Let's even just talk about and nobody's doing BizDep or Bitcoin to developers like as the L1, I mean, so, but if you're just trying to do ordinal development, I mean, there's all these kinds of things you have to do. And it's kind of weird and unnatural, you know, with, um, you know, with Ethereum development, you have to deal with Solidity and, uh, you know, some of the issues of development there uh, as a programming language. So, um, you know, I mean, I guess from the development side, now you're really deep on the development side. So I'm asking, I'm really asking this. Isn't, doesn't that matter quite a bit too, right? Someone could give you like a great sweet deal, have a lot of money, throw a lot of money at you, but if it's just, you know, such a pain to develop or you can't even develop the thing you want to on the chain, it feels like the technical implementation and the development layer is is pretty important, right? You yeah, know, I mean, it's, different chains. it's definitely a factor. I mean, I think one of the biggest reasons that Ethereum has continued to keep such a hold um, on the DeFi market is because of the EVM. Uh, standard. So, you know, for our side, right, we, we wrote all of our uh, smart contracts to be EVM compatible. So we are naturally prioritizing any, you know, project that's basically using uh, that environment right now. Um, so I definitely think the EVM uh, is like a real factor. And like we want to launch, uh, for instance, on Solana. And so we're looking at like Neon, which is basically like their bridge um, between Ethereum and Solana. But, you know, for instance, like Cardano reached out and they have a lot of liquidity actually going into RWAs, but yeah, that's definitely a factor, right? Because we need a Haskell uh, engineer, um, or I think they have an L2 that's compatible. But yeah, I agree on that sense. It's definitely a thing. And I also think um, what a lot of projects are going to now is like, how quickly can you spin up uh, your own L2 uh, on top of the base layer? So I think uh, Optimism has a really popular stack. It's called the OP stack. And I think that's what Coinbase actually built their base chain on. So yeah, like I'm not saying it, it isn't a factor. Um, and I think particularly for certain use cases like gaming or like social or like storage uh, heavy applications, um, they care a lot about those dimensions. But even still, uh, for each category, there are still a lot of options. Like when we're looking at it, there you know there's over a dozen legitimate like EVM compatible uh, chains we can be looking at. Um, you know. We like the OP stack, but then we've seen like Cosmos has um, a really nice stack as well. And so I just think it can kind of turn into a losing battle if that's the only thing. Like, I, I do agree there's a, a minimum standard there for onboarding. 
um, but it can't be the only thing. Uh, that was like kind of my biggest learning of like, like money. Mm-hmm. Kind of like in some ways, money solves problems in the sense that you can go out and get people who can develop on that on that chain. Is kind of what I'm hearing, right? Um, a little bit. Yeah, it's definitely uh, a piece of it as well. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, John, what, what's your reaction to this? And then uh, we will move on to Polkadot. Yeah. Uh, the AMA. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I could take a pretty unpopular position maybe on this that I, I it, fundamentally for at least for gaming i'm not sure any of the chains really have an advantage over each other right now um and the way i kind of liken that is like it's kind of like the file io you know it's very base level and, and honestly this is a mistake we made you know earlier earlier we thought we had to own the chain that's really really important we have to control that and what we're finding now is that's not really the value add to gaming right the value add to gaming is what you build on top of it right and the chains themselves are 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 you know kind of similar you can kind of replace one with another and 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 i think what, what we're seeing right now for example i'll use one 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 example and i, I think we've we've come up recently with what i think is probably the best use i've seen at least of gaming meets web3 and so so here's here's a, a quick quick analysis of it you know in the past couple of years you could go in we have again this nfl rivals i'll use that as an example i could i could say i want patrick mahomes on my team just won the super bowl cards now going for you know the, the assets going for a thousand dollars let's say and in the past, I could basically using chain tech, I could be like, cool, I'll, I'll buy it. I can buy it through a ramp with, with a credit card. I could buy it with crypto. Or, you know, we started evolving and said, okay, cool, now we can make an offer. I, I don't want to pay $1,000, I'll pay eight fifty, right? And anybody that takes that deal, I can kind of use a smart contract to secure that deal. And that's, that was kind of a nice little evolution. But what we're seeing now, that doesn't really speak to gamers still. You know, gamers are not crypto traders. They're, frankly, they're not really looking a lot of times at floors and asks and bids and, and all that type of stuff that a lot of these marketplace techs are sitting for. They are looking for, I want this value and I'm willing to give up this value, right? And two things kind of come out of that. One is that... Um, if you look at gaming systems, right, peer-to-peer trading has been in gaming for decades, right? I mean, we saw it in EverQuest and World of Warcraft, and there's a similar interface if you looked at the actual UX experience of that. It's a left side pops up, and it says, here's the things I'm going to receive, and the right side pops up of here's what I'm going to give up, right? So peer-to-peer trading has been a very, very normal mantra of gaming for decades, and what we're able to do now, and this is, again, this is a little bit independent of the chain tech, but you want to make sure you have the chain tech that can support all these other initiatives over time. But what we're doing now is that I can say, hey, um, we have enough liquidity in our marketplace tech, and we have enough understanding of how that liquidity is working, and now we do have tons of bids and asks in the Web3 world that we can now deliver that experience in a quality way to gamers. I come up, I pull up Patrick Mahomes, I have $1,000 on the left side, it values it in real time based on what's happening on the chain. And on the right side, I can see all my my NFTs, right? My digital assets that maybe I'm going to give up. Maybe I'm not I'm not in with the Packers right now, so I'm going to give up six Packers. And as I select those six, it's going to start totaling them up in real time to where it prices them up, right? And then suddenly it's like, cool, oh man, these six actually equal a thousand dollars trading value. And then to the player now, I can hit go, you know, trade. And I now have married kind of this gaming concept back to Web three. So the player now receives Patrick Mahomes and gives up the five Green Bay Packers. In reality, what's happening, and this is, I think, the superpower of where Web3 is going to really deliver a gaming experience, is in reality what just happened is we facilitated a pretty multi-party trade to where in real time I received Patrick Mahomes. And so I, in real time, Mythical essentially bought Patrick Mahomes from one one buyer or one seller. And then we in real time sold five Green Bay Packers to five, potentially five different buyers all at the same time. And to me, that's the type of application that's really going to move this stuff. We put this out into our D-Market product last year in tw- early 2023 as a test and kind of been optimizing it. And now makes up 80% of all transaction volume. You know, D-Market is doing nearly a million dollars a day in transaction volume, USD. Um, from these types of trades. And to me, again, it, it's a little less about the particular fundamentals of the chain, and it's more kind of can we build on top of that and deliver these real user experiences for the for the audience and the market that we're going after, right? So yeah. those are things we've seen a lot of, and it's, it's just become, um, we're finally at the point now that we can kind of start doing this. And so for me, looking at chains are more about what what can it do for decentralization? What can it do for governance? What can it do for you know voting mechanisms and staking mechanisms and things like that, rather than just some of the fundamentals of you know what what can Polygon do versus Avalanche? Well, yeah. Right? So and and to tee up the next convo, and I and then I, we 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 are moving over to Polkadot, but tee up this is how, because we should have a whole space on, on this, and we do have gaming spaces regularly. But to your initial point uh, that you that you analogized uh, really well about layer ones now not being great i mean look at for example crypto kitties right that's it the game design was in the erc 721 contract and they couldn't change it later uh and they regretted that right so and 
if you know anything about making games, it's all about iteration, iteration, iteration. I mean, look how many updates there are to Fortnite. You know, perhaps one of the most popular games of all time, uh, if not the most popular games of all time. They're constantly changing their seasons, upgrading weapons, etc. So if you put the game design on chain, which I think at this point a lot of folks aren't doing as much, uh, but if they, if you do, there's a permanence to it that might not be desirable, right? So um, in some ways, there are some fundamental incompatibilities of, of development there. Now, owning an asset might be different, right? Like owning a cosmetic asset. But if it's about the game design itself being written into the chain that's uh, that you can't change later, uh, you know, it's um, it's a little bit different. That's why I think a lot of the, you know, blockchains and the layer ones that, you know, including yours, right? Um, you know, it's more like, I mean, Ripple XRPL uh, gets uh, a lot of flack for being, gets some flack for its unique node list and being a little more centralized than the other blockchains. I mean, despite that, it's doing very well. But uh, you, you kind of want to be able to control your chain uh, as you develop your, your your game, right? Or your, um, you know, your experience, so to speak. But, uh, but John, I, I think you and I could, could probably jump into that for, for, for eons. But right now is the time to uh, pivot. Uh, we're really pleased to have the Polkadot team. Uh, really excited to have them on here. Polkadot is, is one of the OGs. Uh, when it comes to crypto um, asset classes, uh, the original white paper by by Gavin Wood came out. I think it was 2016. I remember reading that back then. Was really impressed, um, as I think a lot of people in the crypto industry uh, were. And uh, you know, the genesis block for Polkadot was was mined in 2020. It's been trading for a while. It's now uh, one of the top chains in the world by market cap. I think about 10 billion in market cap as of today. Uh, so I think it's number 13 uh, ahead of uh, some name big names like Polygon. Um, yeah. Uh, really excited to have have the Polkadot team on here. So I'm going to flip it over to you know Bill, um, Inga, and uh, Philippa Webb uh, to talk a little bit about uh, Polkadot and tell us a little more. Sure. I guess. Um, excuse me. I guess I'll start. Um, yeah. So so Polkadot, uh, we call it a heterogeneous uh, sharded blockchain. But in you know, layman's terms, this is just you know, a, an actually sharded blockchain where you have lots of different blockchains that people can develop and then they are secured by the Polkadot relay chain. So we do have the Polkadot SDK, the software development kit that is used, uh, you know, not just for these teams uh, that are building directly on Polkadot, but lots of other teams uh, like, you know, uh, the Avail Network, uh, Midnight on Cardano, a lot of other teams use this uh, blockchain development framework. Um, and so the basic idea of Polkadot is that you know, anyone can go and build their own blockchain and get all the security uh, that you would have you know, of building on Polkadot. Uh, you know, it gets uh, shared uh, with anyone. So we uh, also are very interested in decentralization. So you know, one of my role, Director of Education and Governance Initiatives, I'm really focused on ensuring that we have you know, a truly decentralized uh, community and blockchain that's actually governed by the dot holders and not by you know, some hidden multi-sig or the developers or anyone else, but only the people that hold dot. Uh, that's my, that's my two-minute uh, <laughs> intro. Awesome. Great. Great. What about your, your colleagues? So Inga and uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Let, let me know and Philippa Webb. I guess I can... Can you hear me? We can hear you just fine. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for inviting me at this space. I'm uh, Filippo and I'm a technical educator at the Web3 Foundation, which is uh, behind uh, the Polkadot uh, network. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, just adding on top of what uh, Bill said, I think that uh, the way Polkadot is, uh, is designed is uh, to, to promote and uh, no, to, to in to make sure that people, they, they build chain that has specific use cases and they concentrate on the use case without reinventing the wheel. So you have this like uh, SDK that allows you to, to, the, to deploy, uh, to build your own chain with uh, different modules. You want to have like, uh, I don't know, like um, to transfer between fun funds and uh, between account, you can uh, add this. Oh, there's a there's a bit of a um, does anyone have a hot mic? There's a bit of a uh, echo. Um, okay, it seems gone now, but yeah, back to you, Filippo. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you just okay. fine. Yeah, yeah. So you have this uh, SDK that al allows you to concentrate on the use case, and um, and also the way that Polkadot is built is uh, very efficient. We have seen also last year in uh, December there was kind of a craziness about uh, inscription on Polkadot. And just to quote some numbers, there were like uh, more than 13 million transactions in two days. 
and uh, the chain reached uh, 220 transactions per second, and uh, the block space, uh, the, the blocks were filled around uh, three, four percent on uh, on average during those days. So it's a very, very efficient uh, chain that allows really to to um, to withstand large pressure in transactions, and uh, this is actually the also one of the use cases of. Uh, of this um, of this network is that uh, since it's a sharded network that has a lot of layer ones that uh, they depend and uh, they basically um, they they access what Polkadot provides with, with it, which um, this um, share security and interoperability where chain can communicate between each other. Um, it must be very efficient at the layer zero level, so it must uh, it must use block space in a very efficient way. And uh, there, there must not be the situation where, I don't know, like uh, NFTs, uh, like kitties, they, they occupy the, the blocks that must be used to, to secure, um, you know, like all these layer ones that actually have, uh, you know, they, they are basically businesses that uh, are enterprise grade uh, chains. So yeah, that's my... Yeah, so maybe for the audience here, I think most of the audience here uh, knows certainly what layer ones are, things like, you know, uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin and uh, the Ethereum mainnet. Can you sort of break down uh, this sort of unique approach uh, to the idea of being layer zero uh, for the audience here? And, and part of having multiple chains is, I mean, for example, is part of that trying to solve the, 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 the trilemma, the blockchain trilemma of security, scalability, and decentralization? Like, is that the you know, is that the goal um, or is there some other and or are there other things that uh, the audience here can be, you know, sort of enlightened by in terms of benefits uh, to this uh, heterogeneous sharding uh, architecture? Yeah. So I think the the idea of an L1 is that's something that end users are going to want to interact with. Right. Um, and so when you have an L2 on top of that, you know, so like, you know, generally Ethereum L2s. That's, you know, that's something else that users can also interact with, right? They can go onto the Ethereum mainnet and do things that may be more expensive, but you still can do things. And then you have these L2s also on top of it. The idea of L0, this is not meant to be something that you know, the ordinary end user is going to interact with. It's at a, you know, a more foundational level. So the idea of the re what we call the relay chain, the central chain of uh, Polkadot that's supporting the parachains, the L1s, you know, that relay chain, its goal is really just to spend all of its time and all of its focus, uh, not to anthropomorphize too much, uh, on supporting these, these other L1s. And this actually provides a lot of efficiency, right? That you're not clogging up the L1 with other things. It could be focused just on providing you a really you know, secure and, and scalable um, uh, mechanism for the for these other chains. So I would say in terms of the trilemma, like definitely security and uh, scalability uh, are helped by uh, you know, by this heterogeneous sharding. Uh, decentralization, not always necessarily, but definitely with the way Polkadot's doing it. You know, we are certainly uh, focusing on ensuring that you know, the governance of this chain and the ownership of the chain and the, the running of the chain uh, is decentralized. You know, having a, a very high Nakamoto coefficient. Uh, is very important to us. Uh, ensuring that we have um, you know, participation in governance is very important. But I wouldn't say that's like directly uh, part of uh, what sharding helps to achieve. Yeah. What are the challenges? Um, so, what are the unique? So, those that's great. There's a great overview of some of the unique uh, ways in which the architecture benefits. What are some of the challenges in, in architecting it this way? And why? Like, for example, can another you know, group of developers create this from, like, what, what are the challenges that uh, in terms of a moat or competitive moat that you guys have? I mean, is it just like having moved uh, earlier and gotten, you know, scale? Uh, or are there other things that make this just, you know, technically difficult? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, from from a technical perspective, I mean, there, there are a lot of challenges, right, to having a, uh, you know, to having an L0 that can support this, having the, um, uh, uh, the, the, what's the word? You know, all the tools that are necessary, you know, to produce things on them. It's not the same as like you know a copy of an EB, EVM chain, right? You know, you have to have you know sort of a, a different approach to things. And you know, this is this brings up something actually that you know that that Udi said, and I think John may have also um, mentioned it that you know like you know Polkadot has really been making a lot of changes lately, uh, and a big part of that is you know. The
the first really few years of its existence, uh, first really few years of its existence, uh, You know, there have been a lot of things that we tried out, discovered what works and what doesn't. But luckily, you know, Polkadot is extremely flexible. That's one of the reasons I was so interested in it in from, from the beginning is like, you know, seeing what could happen. And we've seen, you know, what works, what doesn't, built up, uh, you know, the infrastructure and the tooling. Uh, and that's taken a long time. It's taken a few years. But I think you know, we're really seeing, you know, the fruits of that now. We're seeing... Um, uh, you know, we figured out you know what works, what doesn't, what tools are necessary, you know what tools aren't necessary, uh, and are now you know, really you know moving, especially over the next six months or so, into a uh, you know a really uh, like evolutionary step of of the chain. That, that makes sense. Let's go to governance because that's also you know seemingly unique. I mean, there's governance all across crypto, but <laughs> for example, I'm, I'm curious if you were to think about. If you were to think about the, like, well, how concentrated are, for example, the votes? So, for example, in other L1s, you know, you got, like, the foundation that, own, you know, that has, you know, earnest quite a bit of the votes, and a lot of people just go with the foundation, whatever the foundation is behind that layer one. Um, and then you have even, you know, DeFi stuff, like in Compound, there's, like, you know, the leaderboards of who has a lot, and it turns out, you know, like, A16Z, <laughs> you know, like a traditional, you know, VC has quite a bit of the, the governance, for example, behind uh, behind that, that particular DeFi protocol. You know, I'm a big fan of, of, of their company, by the way. So is uh, the governance, well, first off, how does the governance work, right? So OpenGov, um, you know, how does that work in the Polka assembly? And then uh, how decentralized is it really, right? Yeah, so OpenGov, uh, let me just give a very brief overview of how it works. Uh, but it, it's relatively simple. It's one dot is one vote. Uh, and everything can be adjusted and modified by OpenGov, so go, but cannot be done by the developers, by anyone else, right? So if you're familiar with Tezos, uh, that's probably the closest mechanism, except they're only the validators. Yeah, yeah, I know Kathleen. Go. I know I'm friends with Kathleen, so yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so it's sort of a similar concept, right? The runtime, the actual rules of the chain are stored in a WebAssembly blob on the chain, uh, and that can be modified only by governance. Um, so the, again, slight difference from Tezos, but sort of that same basic idea of uh, you know, the actual rules of the chain can be modified, which means anything is up for vote and only modifiable by, by dot holders. Um, so we've, we've actually seen in the past, you know, where, where Parity, one of the lead developers on Polkadot, issued a runtime upgrade uh, on Kusama, our Canary network, uh, and it actually got voted down, right? Uh, so we have actually, you know, you, know, I, you uh, may have seen, you know, we've been very, very uh, focused on ensuring that you know we are you know decentralized that we're doing things and um, you know, we, we have announced that you know we are, you know we are now software and not a security. Uh, we haven't tried to ensure that you know this voting power is spread out as as much as possible. Uh, and in fact, you know you were saying about like you know foundations often having you know a large uh, percentage uh, of dot. Uh, so we, we just announced uh, last week our decentralized voices program where we are delegating um, uh, 42 million dot worth of voting power uh, to other you know, uh, voices in the ecosystem, right? So they'll be able to vote uh, on behalf with that dot. And so we're, you know, we are accepting applications for people who have been you know, already participating in governance, but maybe don't have a lot of voting power. Um, you know, there, there is always the issue, right, of, you know, uh, whales in the ecosystem that have, you know, more voting power. But we do have some mechanisms for avoiding that. Uh, so, for instance, you know, this decentralized voices program, uh, what we call conviction voting. So you can lock up your dot for longer and get uh, more voting power. So if you say, I'm not going to, you know, my dot will be locked uh, for uh, six times as long, I'll uh, get, um, I'm sorry, I get the number, like four times as long, I get four times the, the voting power. If I want to do it eight times as long, I get five times the voting power. Uh, so we do try, you know, and we've adjusted some of these parameters and features as time goes on uh, to try to make um, the uh, uh, different voices in the community able to participate and make it decentralized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super cool. And just to be clear, the the circulating supply of DOT is about 1.3 billion DOT. Is that right? So there's about 1.3 billion votes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it's 1.4 billion. Yeah, about that. correct numbers. What's that? Yeah, that's correct. About 1.3, 1.35. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head right now. Yeah. 
So, so the, okay, so this is an interesting thing about governance, and, and then maybe I'll go back to the, the questions you want to chat with, but like your governance with blockchain crypto has always been interesting. It seems like you guys are doing it uh, very thoughtfully, which I think is unique among, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people who are being thoughtful, but there's a lot who are not being thoughtful. So, you know, obviously in the United States, you know, one person or at least one citizen is one vote, regardless of how rich or poor they are, right? I mean, the problem is a lot of people just don't vote. Um, in, in crypto, you know, you're seeing, I mean, even more inequality. So the Gini coefficient or the wealth inequality being even more. And so you're having, you know, the people who are already wealthy whales, you know, like the A16Zs, the Andreessen Horowitz of the world, having like huge chunks of certain DeFi protocols. So like, is that, I mean, it, the, that's what I would call a plutocracy as opposed to a democracy. Like, is, is that the right way to go though? Is that the correct like architecture, but then of course, how do you verify a person's a person, right? In the Polkadot ecosystem or any ecosystem, right? So, so it's just like, hey, rich people still get to decide, and they, in fact, compared to the real world, they get to decide more. I mean, maybe that is the right way. Maybe there's no other way to do it. But I'd love to get your thoughts about that. Yeah, th this is something actually we've thought about uh, quite a bit. Um, and if you go to the Polkadot forum, uh, you'll see some discussions uh, on this. Um, so, so the problem is you're having a you're like a one person, one vote. Tr system that is civil resistant in a decentralized world is extremely difficult. Um, and there have been actually some attempts to do things uh, similar to this. So, you know, Kilt, uh, obviously, so I'm sure, you know, Ingo can talk more about that. Uh, and Cointer uh, has a different approach of like uh, person to person, sort of like old PGP signing parties. I don't know if uh, people still do them anymore. You know, people meet in person, they can do uh, person ver uh, verification. Um, but the problem is at a doing this in a decentralized way that's scalable to the entire world is really difficult. So I would say that the um, it's it's not optimal, right? Uh, you know, the, the one dot one vote. I do think it's one of the best ways that we can do it. You know, at the like you know fundamental uh, base chain way. But you know, Web three Foundation, we have you know quite a few researchers. We've looked into you know, like variations on the votes. Again, we have uh, programs where. You know, you could say that the foundation is like, you know, a baby whale in the ecosystem and we are, you know, giving, you know, like deliberately delegating our votes to others to, yeah, um, uh, yeah. and I actually, I remember uh, like, you know, Andreessen Horowitz, you mentioned, I heard the, someone from, I can't remember which podcast, you know, they did something similar. They found students like and delegated their Uniswap voting rights. Uh, and so I think that's, I mean, that's not perfect again, but, you know, I think that like, you know, we see you know, actors in the ecosystem, you know, that want to decentralize it, like that, that's certainly a good thing. Uh, and maybe that's the best, you know, we could hope for now. But I, I do think this is not the, you know, the end result, right? This is not the, the, the highest form of on-chain democracy that we're going to see. Uh, the mm -hmm. nice thing about Polkadot, of course, is that you know, we do change and hope to keep changing in the future as we figure out the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. Super fascinating. Thanks. Uh, Philip Webb. Yeah. And then Inga, if you guys want, if you want to jump in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I want yeah, to. So, um, uh, oh. I think when we, when we look at democracy in, in, in such a system, uh, we shall not always look at nation states as, as a comparison. You can also, for example, look at companies, and there are normally not one person, one vote, uh, most of the companies at least. Uh, so, uh, there, there's always um, there, there's things that you have to consider, and I think that, it, that uh, democracy. Uh, like the democracy which is happening on Polkadot is like in a liquid state. So as Polkadot, as we heard before, uh, is very much changeable and can be changed by the community. What we see now is that things in the democracy actually change and uh, are being made more fair and making, uh, being made more transparent and even uh, being, um, yeah, so it, it's constantly changing by the community. Um, and we see also off-chain things, which are which I think is absolutely amazing. So we see like a press is coming up, um, like where people start discussing about uh, people and things and uh, things that should be done and should not be done. And this influences the votes of people uh, in a way, like in a real democracy. So uh, I, I think we shouldn't only uh, look at this one thing uh, where, where people apparently, if they have a lot of thoughts, uh, that they have a lot of power. Um, as we heard before, there's also uh, the, uh, the possibility of conviction voting. So even if you have less thoughts, you can, if you are really convinced about doing something, you can put in more weight and, and stuff like that. So I think there's, there's uh, tons of possibilities in these uh, mechanisms that Polkadot is 
producing and which are evolving uh, all the time. And the most important thing for that may be in the future, not even Polkadot itself, because all these are modules which can be then copied to the parachains, to the layer ones. So when I'm running a parachain, what I'm doing, um, I can inherit those functionalities, I can play with them, I don't have to take all of them, I can take some of them, I can even modify them and put them in my chain. And that anyone who runs a chain on Polkadot can do that. And this is, I think, a, a, a huge power. And even if I would now say, okay, we're doing a chain which is very much used for KYCs and stuff like that, I could even introduce a one person, one vote thing on my uh, power chain using the mechanisms of Polkadot and, uh, and the me mechanisms of KILT together. And that would be possible. So all these things are made possible. You have to think of Polkadot more like an infrastructure, actually, uh, which allows you to build great things. And Polkadot is where all those experiments are basically made and you can see how it works and then you can uh, just uh, pick a mix from the stuff that has been done by the community for your purchase and this is the great feature i would say yeah I, you know i think it's i mean i i, I you know i'm reminded of plato plato's republic where he like very much didn't like democracy and he was a big fan of enlightened dictatorships and one might argue that I mean, it's probably pretty clear some very successful companies today are probably enlightened or, depending on your view, unenlightened dictatorships, right? I mean, look at Meta uh, right now, which is effectively still controlled by uh, its founder and CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, because of its voting voting shares. Um, and there are many other companies that are good examples of that. But um, yeah, so I mean, it's but it's interesting because if you wanted to achieve the one vote uh, paradigm, if you thought that was a good one, it's still difficult to achieve, you know, technically because it's like, you know, the, the dead bodies problem, right? When you vote, it's like vote early and often, like back in the old, uh, you know, history of the US, people would go to grave graves and uh, look at names and have them do votes. Like, how do you do that? How do you verify that, uh, you know, in, in, in Web3 and in a decentralized world, if you want to implement that, of course. Now, Filippo Webb, I would love to hear you uh, jump in. And by the way, Inga, I don't know if you can hear Filippo, but let me know if you if you can't, and then we'll bring you back up and down if you can't hear him. But Filippo, go for it. Yeah, uh, I would just wanted uh, to add... Oh, it might be that Inga can't hear Filippo, but Filippo, go for it. Um, I think Inga can hear me, which is great. But Inga, we might bring you up down and request you back up because Filippo was uh, was speaking. But yeah, well, Filippo, go for it. No, yeah, regarding again the one dot, uh, one vote, or one person, one vote. I mean, uh, in the end, Polkadot is a proof of stake, which means that there is a financial security is largely important because it uh, guarantees the security of the network. So if you do one person, one vote, what will happen is that, uh, for example, a whale, why should, I, why should I have a lot of tokens? Yes, maybe speculation or like uh, purely investment. But here, you know, like if you have that amount of tokens, you have uh, that, that strength into the, in, the, in the governance. And I think it's a, a very important point to, to, keep, in, uh, to keep in mind. Because, um, because otherwise, why would someone, um, you know, uh, own uh, a, large, a large amount of dot? And, uh, and, and big accounts are really important in the ecosystem because they, they, if, they, if they stake, then uh, their, um, their amount of uh, tokens goes and backs up all the validators and really contributes to the security of the system. On top of that, you also have, um, you know, power in the governance because you have a lot of stake, you have a lot to lose and uh, and you have like a stronger voice compared to to the other holders that are a little bit smaller, I mean, that are smaller than you. But uh, I think this also is the natural uh, system of a uh, proof of stake and the fact that the security of the chain, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's dependent on, uh, on, um, on the financial, I mean, it's basically the financial security locked on chain. Right, I think that's a great overview. Um, you know, I, I feel like we could go on this for, for so long, but um, what are the things, uh, so we will have to be closing soon, I know we're chatting for a while, but we are running close on time, but um, what are the biggest challenges uh, that you guys are all facing and you're seeing in terms of building, um, you know, just in general? Uh, and then my next question after that is just, what would you like to leave the, uh, the audience with? But let's go with the challenges first as you build the ecosystem.
Yeah, I would say, uh, Mark, uh, you know, you're, you're very, uh, you know, Saitel is, is very involved with a lot of these uh, teams. Uh, maybe you have a good overview uh, of these? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, yeah, let me hop in here. So what, what are the challenges? Um, so Polkadot was very, very high profile uh, when it was announced, when it was the, you know, token generation, and the first um, uh, crowd loans for parachains, and then the bear market came, and tech took a little bit longer to be delivered, and so parachains were launching into a difficult market. And with the result being that, you know, I've heard countless times um, the last two years is that Dodd is dead. And, uh, you know, it's funny now with all of the changes that are happening now and with the, you know, fundamental design of Polkadot to be able to uh, consistently upgrade the technology to be flexible. Um, and we see that crowd loans made sense at the time, but in, in the longer term, they weren't working so well. Now it's, it, we pivot uh, away from that and toward a more open and less siloed system where we'll get the, the core time uh, easier to um, uh, allocate to. Um, uh, but nevertheless, having a, a kind of negative sentiment, I think, is the biggest challenge. And, and, you know, Bill, you mentioned before that there are teams building on Polkadot Tech. They're not advertising that they're doing it. There are teams within the ecosystem that are very successful, but they're not advertising that they're, they're on Polkadot Tech. And why is that? And, and that's a, that's a open question. I have my ideas. Maybe, maybe some other people have different ideas. Uh, but I will, what I will say is that, um, Parity had a great reputation for being one of the best development houses in Ethereum. Um, and once Polkadot was announced and, uh, launched, it, took on that development task and then a lot of other tasks. And as many may know, uh, toward the end of last year, there was a big decentralization that happened. And this decentralization is one of the reasons that we're having this uh, space right now to talk about Polkadot. This is not something that was possible before. And this is something that, uh, you know, this decentralization is unleashing massive activity in the community. And I couldn't be more excited by the prospects um, in, in 2024. One of the big ones is um, Mythical Games. So we heard John speak before. This is the biggest game in blockchain. It's, a, it's eclipsed uh, activity uh, that Axie Infinity had at its height. And it's not being talked about that way. And one of the reasons is, is the architecture that a lot of the activity or all of the activity is happening on a private chain. Um, once a migration happens over to uh, Polkadot, that changes. And there's going to be massive increase in wallets and uh, uh, activity, on-chain activity that will be obvious for everyone to see. And, um, you know, there are going to be airdrops on Polkadot. The first two are coming are meme coins. I can't talk too much about other ones that are not meme coins that will be coming after that, but, but we will hear about those. And this is all empowered by OpenGov, where the community has a big say in what's happening and with the treasury and on chain. And while there's voting on many other chains, I can't, I don't know any that are, that is also executed through, through on chain activity. So I've heard, you know, many instances in, where um, there have been voting decisions that happened, but have not been executed by the humans. And 
this is not possible again on, on Polkadot. So you, you could even think about uh, Polkadot as the world's largest, most active DAO right now that is, that is actually decentralized, is actually autonomous, and, you know, the O is there for everybody. And you know, even the founder, Gavin Wood, he's, we haven't heard that much from him. We will hear more from him this year. He's been in Dubai. He's coming back to Dubai to speak at a couple of conferences, which I think is very cool. He's spoken, you know, just a couple of weeks ago in Hong Kong. And, and we all want to hear from him because he's an absolute visionary. But even he is someone who has influence on the direction of Polkadot, but doesn't have final say. And I think that's awesome. Um, that's, that's yeah. So I was supposed to talk about challenges. I can't, well, I'm going to run well, along. No, I, well, no, I think those are those are great challenges, and it highlights well. It highlights a few things. The first thing is is not a challenge. Well, well, the last thing you talked about was more about some of the benefits, right? I mean, you know, Bitcoin. We we obviously have a lot of Bitcoin hodlers. I'm sure in the in the audience and just generally in the world. But uh, you know, we saw before we. I think we were con before the block size wars a few years ago. I think we were concerned about you know fifty one percent of tax, maybe quantum computing. Um, but it turns out that actually the bigger problem was you know what happens when the Bitcoin a small group of Bitcoin core developers, uh, you know, have hold a GitHub repo, um, you know, are you know fighting with the miners right who hold you know a lot of Nvidia graphics cards and uh, you know and access to a lot of cheap energy. And we saw what happened with the block size wars. It's interesting. It was a very small group of people who sort of decided that, uh, right? And of course, the governance wasn't on chain. Um, so it's interesting you're highlighting that. And I think that's what, you know, a lot of decentralized crypto folks dream of when they dream of, you know, DAOs and, and, and how to make decisions in a decentralized way. So I'm really glad you, you, you highlighted that. The other thing you highlighted in terms of the, when you started was sort of the degen energy. Um, and I'm curious about, like, basically, and you even mentioned that you're going to be having some meme coins pop up. Uh, you know, an airdropped, so to speak. Uh, but what, you know, it's, it's, the problem is that, you know, the when moon culture or number go up culture is just so ingrained in a lot of the degen culture that is inherent in a lot of crypto activities, certainly around retail, uh, uh, less so around institutional, though you see it in institutional as well. So I, I guess, um, and you did talked about a, an issue being you launched, you know, you, you, I think mine, the Genesis block back in 2020. So, um, and we've had, you know, We've had a bull market. We've had a bear market since then. And so, you know, for example, I, there are some other L1s that have like an army. Is there like a dot army out there? That like folks who are, or there like a lot of people who are detractors. I mean, of course, you're gonna have both in any crypto ecosystem. But I'd be curious to see is that the problem? Like, it's more about you know the the the, the folks who are holders of dot just focusing on number go up, you know, relentlessly over you know at least in Bitcoin, people don't seem to do that. You have this group of hodlers that don't care if number go up or number go down. They're just going to hold till till you know till infinity. So, is that culture existent here or not? Well, maybe maybe you remember that there were a bunch of projects, you know, just putting Polka on their name that had nothing to do with Polkadot. Um, and so that DJ culture was there. I think everyone here now is um, you know really dedicated and believers in the tech and believers in the in the future. Uh, whether because you know we're just still emerging from a bear market and and let's face it there were you know the two top parachains like number one and number two one was Akala and they had a, a you know a very unfortunate incident with their stable coin uh, which had a bug in it and the other was um, Moonbeam, which had, uh, you know, a number of issues with the biggest one being Nomad being hacked. And that was where everyone was bridging in from. So both with the top two parachains getting wrecked for reasons having nothing to do with Polkadot tech, but, you know, in, in Moonbeam's case, an unfortunate uh, reliance on the third party bridge. Um, and in Akala's case, it was, you know, the, the contract was not properly uh, audited before uh, deployed. Um, yeah, that's going to take the air out of uh, anybody's balloon, let's say. Um, and, and so with that, a lot of the, the DeFi, they were, were where most of the DeFi was happening. But then let's say the number three was Astar, uh, which is doing really well is multi-chain 
now with the uh, imminent launch of uh, ZK EVM uh, with Polygon. Uh, but they'll never leave the Polkadot ecosystem uh, because very inherent parts of their architecture uh, can only happen on Polkadot. So uh, DAP staking is, is very innovative. I don't know, know if people heard of it, uh, but it's a way of, of staking to DAPs, which get rewards then and then continue to build with a, a now with they have a new version, V3, of their DAP staking, which um, encourages uh, constant rotation of the DAPs that you're selecting to uh, sponsor. So uh, I think, you know, and, and if, if people follow what's going on, it's, it's so active now, or what's happening. So there's talk lately, in a, and big talk, uh, about an open EVM. Uh, where DOT will be the, the gas token just to encourage an easier way for DGENs and, and, and others to come and, and build directly on Polkadot within a familiar system. Yeah, that makes sense. And it sounds like the, I mean, you know, the, the criticism of L1s as, you know, effectively having competitive modes is that, you know, you see projects, big projects like DGODs, for example, which started in Solana, last year, you know, migrated to Ethereum. Um, curious. So in this case, I guess, what are the ways in which you mentioned a project just now that's going to stay on, stay on Polkadot because of, you know, some of the, uh, the architecture of the project sounded like, you know, what are the ways in which uh, those mechanisms will continue to hold over time versus, you know, just people just kind of jumping between chains? Sounds like Bill has a, Bill has a opinion on that. Go for it, Bill. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, actually, I was going to say I need uh, I, I need to get I need to get going. Uh, so I yeah. just wanted to wave to everybody. Uh, it's, it's late here uh, over in Switzerland. So yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, you, I mean we're we're about to close. So uh, it was a pleasure having you. But if you want to give final thoughts, feel free. I'm, I'm going to ask your the team here. Uh, to both thank you for the time, but also uh, to give final thoughts as well. Yeah, just um, yeah, quick uh, final thoughts. Uh, you know, actually, you you mentioned about like you know uh, you know the culture. Um, you know, I think that you know the polka dot. We do have a very nerdy culture, uh, but it's also very, very passionate. I, um, I don't know of any other ecosystem that has a, uh, a podcast that spends an hour or two twice a week just discussing governance proposals. So that's a uh, Kusumarian's attempts at governance. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's very nerdy, but we have a lot of people that are very passionate. Uh, both about the technology and the culture. So I would recommend if you are outside the ecosystem, uh, yeah, checking checking us out. Uh, and yeah, thanks again for for having us on. Awesome, yeah, great to have you, Bill. Uh, the rest of the Polkadot team, just final thoughts, or I mean, you can address my question as well, but just final thoughts as we come to a close. I know it's been uh, it's been quite the space. Yeah, uh, I think I could jump in really quick and hand the one to Filippo, but I wanted to chime in on on your your question about what is the hardest thing, right, uh, for Polkadot? And, and look, I think one of the hardest things is building mindshare, right? And in 2017, 2016, this vision of app chains was proposed, and this is the vision that Gavin and also Cosmos sort of proposed. And it's taken almost a decade for everyone to come and say, yes, this is the way. We need these separate chains for particular use cases. And this is again because mindshare and narratives, you know, the propagate create sometimes the propagate create across ecosystems take over, right? And some, some sometimes things that are new, innovative, and harder to understand take time to be adopted. But people are coming around, right? And what we have now at this point in time is that other ecosystems like Polygon, Arbitrum, are following this paradigm, and they're now telling you, hey, you don't have to just build a layer two or a layer three. You can also build a quote unquote sovereign chain. And a sovereign chain is an app chain, right? A standalone chain. And of course, this is under a different branding, but it's similar concepts, right? And of course, different technology. And it's taking a bit of time because, you know, Polkadot decided not to play the dog and pony show, right? Polkadot not just decide to say, hey, we're going to become crutches to Ethereum. You know, rather they said, we're going to build a framework and a base layer that people could use to innovate and build a blockchain infrastructure that fits their needs. Right, because the thing that's very particular, building infrastructure that fits the business use case. And I tell you, this is someone who's, you know, advising ApeCoin DAO on the efforts of ApeChain, if you're familiar with ApeChain. It is essentially the blockchain for ApeCoin DAO for all things gaming, culture, and NFTs. You know, and everyone from Polygon, Optimism, Arbitrum, CK Sync, they came on and they were pitching the same thing, uh, a plain old vanilla Ethereum layer two, 
right? Nothing different. But this is supposed to be the gaming chain, right? Uh, and frankly, I had to come in and say, you know, we need something that fits the business use case, right? The particular use case for gaming. And that is something what, you know, John is building with Mythical Games, right? But again, you know, it takes time and so forth. But the truth is that, you know, even though Arbitrum is a bit modular and have great tech, and Polygon is also coming up with a CDK to build these layer twos, layer threes, whatever, and sovereign chains, it is not as flexible or robust as a Polkadot SDK, right? And it's not built also with the underlying ethos, right, of Web3 and decentralization. Uh, but again, sometimes the hardest thing is really building mindshare, right? And in particular, it's been a bit tough because Polkadot, they don't just want to play that, um, you know, that down and pony shark call it. They want to build something new and something that scales uh, and allows people to build new infrastructure. But I just want to share those thoughts uh, with you. I love that. That's that's incredible. And uh, yeah, big big uh, big uh, applause for I think just just the incredible growth even over both the the bull and the bear market. So, Philip um, Web, last comments. Uh, we are running uh, uh, short on time. We do have a space coming up, but if you can keep uh, keep a quick final thoughts, we would love to have them. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, yeah, I would be very quick. I think uh, I mean I'm quite impressed that uh, in just uh, you know one year and a half that we have uh, currently like 50 parachain on Polkadot and uh, more than 200 cross-chain channel, I mean, around 200 cross-chain cross channel open. And uh, there are already people, a lot of people that are using these chains. You can, you know, like uh, go and swap on uh, Hydra DX, which is this DEX and send to like, you know, like uh, Hinterlay and take Bitcoin and pay with Lightning Network. Uh, I'm from Lugano, I can pay stuff here with, uh, with Bitcoin. And uh, there is like, uh, you know, decentralized social media, subsocial, they're like, uh, Smart contract platform, A star, the, the prediction market, uh, side guys. There are so many, you know, so many products already. And uh, I think it's just getting started. And uh, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of impressive to think that it's just one and a half year during a bear market. Everything has been delivered, um, you know, uh, seamlessly and quite, quite fast. So I'm really like, I'm really um, excited about uh, the next, the next years and what Polkadot we bring to the Web3 landscape. Awesome. Incredible. Well, thank you so much uh, for having such an incredible discussion. This was great. I feel like we could go on forever, but now is the time. So to all the speakers, thank you. Uh, to our great audience, thanks for your comments. Um, please do follow all the speakers. Follow Polkadot. I think I, I can speak for everyone to say we're excited to see uh, what this unique uh, Layer Zero is going to do in the coming months and more importantly, the coming years. So thanks, everybody. We do these uh, uh, regularly, 9 a.m. Pacific. So we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Goodbye, folks.